Well, hello everyone. Good morning. It's Sunday. Time for us to come before the Lord together and to come before Him, worshiping Him, to see Him again for who He is, to see us for who we are, to see what He has given us. Uh, my name is Rick. I'm one of the pastors at Campus House. It's good to be with you this morning. And uh, just a short opening call to worship, a prayer of confession and receiving God's forgiveness, and a prayer for us to grow. That's where we're going to go right now. And then after that, we'll have our sermon on the next part of 2 Peter chapter 1. That's the sermon series we're in this summer. We're talking about the character traits that are listed in 2 Peter chapter 1. But let's come before the Lord. Let's hear his word and bring our hearts and our minds, our whole being before him, and seek to present ourselves to him as his people. Let me call us to worship from Psalm 145. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. We sing of your glorious majesty, Lord. We tell of your awesome power. We celebrate your abundant goodness, O God, and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works shall give you thanks, O Lord, and we, your faithful people, bless you. We're talking a lot this morning about goodness because the virtue of goodness uh, that Peter describes in 2 Peter chapter 1. But we also see in that passage, as we saw in Psalm 145 a moment ago, that, that God himself is good and all goodness comes from him. We celebrate your abundant goodness, O God. Uh, we see that the Lord is good to all, it says in Psalm 145. The Lord is good to all, but we recognize and we look at our society and we look at ourselves and we see that we are not, we are not good to all. There are many ways in which we have struggled or failed to do good to all. And this is why we come before the Lord, to confess our sin. So that we can say, Lord, we see that what we long for is your character. You are good to all. How we long for things to be good for all. The Lord does too. That's his character. But we, under sin, do not. So let's confess our sin together, based on Psalm 14 and Romans chapter 3. Lord, your word says that there is no one who does good, no one who is righteous on their own, no one who seeks God. We have all turned away and together become worthless, as we know neither the way to peace nor the love of God. We all alike are under the power of sin, and so we are swift to shed blood and speak poison, while ruin and misery mark our ways. Forgive us. Have mercy on us. For the things we have done and the things we have left undone, we repent from the heart and cry out, Lord, save us. Lord, restore us. Living life on our own terms, we have done more harm than good. Let me give you a moment and silently confess your own sin. In the Lord's love for us, in his goodness, in his graciousness, he assures us that when we turn back to him, we are forgiven. We are forgiven and we are restored then to a new kind of life. From Psalm 86, hear this assurance of forgiveness for all who come to the Lord, to all who present themselves before him, confess their sin, cry out to him for his mercy and grace. Here's what is true. The Lord is good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all, to all who call upon him. He gives grace to all who ask it of him. 
Let's pray a prayer briefly for growth before we jump into 2 Peter and hear God's word preached. A prayer for growth, remembering that the Lord is good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all. He is good to all. To all who call upon him, he gives grace to all who ask him. A prayer for growth. We say, turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to be with you this morning. Welcome back to my living room. We are in the early weeks of this summer sermon series on the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1. And we're calling it the Summer Renovation Project. And uh, this, this is the second letter written by the Apostle Peter, and it tells us that God is bringing about the ultimate renovation of his world. This is his grand project, and he is, he's particularly warning Christians that if you've received redemption in Christ, if you've been given renewed life, new life in Christ, then you must be about the business of renovation in your life. You're not the great renovator, but you, in concert, in partaking, in participating with God's work of renovation, of restoration of the world, as you live by faith, you must now walk by faith. You must join with God. And that, that mainly means as he renovates you from the heart. And last week, Rob told us that get, the, the gift that God gives us is faith. Faith is the starting point. It's the foundation of everything that we become in the Christian life. And he got that from first, or 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4 and 5. And he talks about faith. And today we're going to see that while the Christian life is founded upon faith, it is furnished. It's furnished by at least seven other things, Peter says. There's a list of eight characteristics that Peter gives us in 2 Peter 1. And today we're going to see the first of those extra things, those things that get added on to faith. He says you must add these to your faith. Now, it's important, let me use the words of Martin Luther, who said this so well in one sentence, that the Christian faith, we have faith alone. That's the only way that we come to Jesus. It's the only way that we're saved. It's through faith alone, not by anything that you do. But as Martin Luther said, it's faith alone, but a faith that doesn't remain alone. What's that mean? It means that as 2 Peter is going to show us, we're called to grow. Faith doesn't just say, okay, I believe, and now I'm done. Nothing else to do, nothing else to be in the Christian life. No, faith doesn't remain alone. To it gets added all these characteristics, like the fruit of the Spirit, for example. Peter's list in 2 Peter chapter 1 is a lot like the fruit of the Spirit. And so the question of, of 2 Peter, the, the question that Peter is sharing with these young Christians who are in a difficult situation is he's really saying, are you growing? Are you growing in spiritual maturity? Is your life oriented towards this? How do you know if you're growing in spiritual maturity? How do you know if you're growing? How do you know if your faith isn't remaining alone? But because you have faith, so much more is being added to your life. The whole letter of 2 Peter, we might sum it up in one word, grow. Christian, grow in your faith. And the very beginning and the very end of 2 Peter shows us that the whole letter is about growing. It's about growing in godliness. 2 Peter chapter 1 Verse 1 and 2, to those who have obtained faith by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. To those who have already been given faith in Christ, he says, grow, may grace and peace be multiplied. That's a grow word. Multiplication is a growing word. Grow, multiply, may grace and peace be multiplied in you, right? And so the last verse of 2 Peter, in chapter 3, verse 18, says, But 
grow in the grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A lot of people think that Christianity is giving up a bunch of things in order to be a good person, but actually Christianity is growing up into the good character that we've already received from God. Christianity isn't first about giving up a bunch of stuff. It's about growing up into the stuff of God, the things that he wants to add to us. We're to grow into them, to grow up into them. That's what we learn in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 and 7, 5 to 7, which we're focusing on this summer. It, it shows us what it looks like to grow into the good character we've already received from God. Verse 5, 6, and 7 of 2 Peter 1. Peter says, For this reason make every effort to add to your faith. Add to your faith. For this reason, knowing that God has given you all you need, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, neighbor love, loving your neighbor. For the next several weeks, we're going to look at each of these eight characteristics that Peter lists, and this week we are focusing on the second one. Last week we talked about faith, this week we're talking about what's called goodness, as the NIV puts it. I'm going to use a couple other translations of that. The ESV calls it virtue or excellence, which is a good translation. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness or virtue or excellence. But we got to ask, well, what is virtue? What does it really look like? And how do we get it? What is virtue? What does virtue look like? What does goodness look like? And how do we get it? How do we actually grow and add that to our faith? What does Peter mean by goodness or virtue or excellence? What is virtue or excellence? Well, uh, the word translated in your Bible as either goodness, virtue, or excellence, uh, make every effort to add to your faith, goodness, virtue, or excellence, was a very important word in Greek and Roman culture in which Peter's writing into. And it means the sum of all desirable character qualities. It's a term that denotes consummate excellence, the greatest excellence. So in the ancient world, it was common to use this word for uh, like a warrior who exemplifies distinction on the battlefield. Excellence. Uh, boldness, virtue, brave character. Or it would be used of someone who did a lot of common good around their community or their society. So essentially, it gets at this uncommon character that is worthy of praise. It's, a, it's having a praiseworthy character. It's excellent character, aspiring to the highest standards of morality. Because as it gets picked up and carried on, it, it doesn't just mean be excellent, like have a lot of good skills. It means to have excellent moral virtue to really have a character that does the right thing, even when it's costly or hard, like the soldier who runs out to save his fallen soldier in battle, even though it's costly to him, maybe, or dangerous, he goes out and saves him. Peter's essentially saying, bring to your faith, add to your faith, the finest, most excellent character. And we all know that character is not an, abs an abstract, but a very tangible quality. Have you ever heard the phrase, character is what you do when no one is looking? Character is what you do when no one is looking. Well, it's also what you do when everyone is looking. It's just simply what you do because, but go further, character isn't simply what you do. Character is what shapes what you do. Your character will always come out and show up in your actions. And Peter is saying that those who put their faith in Christ cannot simply be content with having faith. They must be content to have faith in Christ in order for, to, to receive salvation. But after that, by faith, still with faith as our foundation, we grow. And we grow into this excellent moral character that is revealed in your actions. What you do actually matters all the time. What you say, what you do, how you act. So Christian writer, or a writer who is a Christian, her name's Hannah Anderson, she makes this great observation, uh, thinking about our current situation and uh, thinking about the protests recently. She said, virtue will lead us to action and align ourselves and to align ourselves with justice. 
Virtue will lead us to action and to align ourselves with justice, but aligning ourselves with justice is not the source of our virtue. Do you see what she's saying? She's saying doing justice is good, and if you're a virtuous person, you will go and do justice. You will do the right things in the world. But that doesn't make you, doing the right things doesn't make you good, right? So virtue is what gives the internal character disposition, the motivations that come out of you into your actions. We are made good, not by what we post online or how we vote politically, but only by God who by our by faith purifies our hearts. When we come to him, he changes us. And as he changes us, we come to reflect his character. And aligning ourselves with something like justice doesn't justify us. Rather, Jesus justified us by doing justice for us. From his character flows love, justice, mercy, goodness. So whenever we are actually partaking or really doing those things in the way that God intended, it's flowing from his character into our character and then out into our actions. True virtue comes from being united by faith to the character of God and then displaying that character of God in the world. So that's what virtue or goodness or excellence is. But what does it look like? Let's try to flesh that out more. What does it look like, goodness, virtue, or excellent moral character? What does that look like? So the word excellence is really helpful. Conrad Mbiwe, a pastor in Zambia, Africa, describes it really well. He says, excellence means achieving the highest degree in something's intended purpose. So, for example, an excellent student is someone who's not content with average grades or just doing busy work, but someone who is diligent to really learn the subject matter, seeking to do their research really well. An excellent student doesn't just get work done as quickly as possible at the last minute simply to meet a deadline, right? But instead, they plan their schedule. They think about how they're going to lay out their studying every day so they can actually learn the material, not cram the material, and just have a little bit of it in their short-term memory, but really learn it to become good at it. An excellent student is someone who brings the finest character, so they're, they're truthful, they're honest, they don't cheat. They also bring the finest quality to their studies and their interactions and relationships on campus. Someone who's an excellent student does, seeks to do all aspects of their learning and community on campus life well. Or think about an excellent employee. An excellent employee in the workplace is someone whom their manager trusts completely. Why? Because the quality of their work is always good. It's always helpful. The manager hardly has to supervise them at all because she trusts that this employee, this excellent employee, will work on the right things in the right way and right on time. So she can focus, the manager can focus her energy elsewhere in the company because this employee is excellent, someone who has the finest character quality. They're trustworthy and they put in the finest quality of work. They are an excellent employee. The foundation of your Christian life is your faith, but you must furnish that faith. Like you furnish a house, the foundation of your life and community is where you live for the most part. You maybe have an apartment or a house, uh, but then you have to furnish it. You have to add to it to make it a home. That's what we're talking about. Our faith gives us every needed structure that we need for life and godliness, Peter says in 2 Peter 1. But then we must add to it the character qualities we've been gifted by faith in Christ. we got to grow up into them. Now, the Old Testament, let's think about another way that this looks. So, excellence. We talk about a student talk about an employee. Those are just ideas of how excellence works. But let's get more specific to what Peter's saying. Excellence in moral virtue. The Old Testament gives us several characters that had faith, and because of their faith, they displayed excellent moral character. They trusted God with their lives, and therefore they lived their lives in such a way that they made every effort, they put all their energy into producing with their lives a moral excellence that others couldn't help but notice. They say, wow, here is a person of God. Here's a man of God. Here's a woman of God. You know that you're on the right track towards, towards excellence, towards excellent moral virtue. Add to your faith this goodness. You know you're on the right track 
if anybody has ever looked at you, whether they believe in God or not, and said, wow, that's what a man of God or a woman of God looks like in every area of their life, with, with your family, with your work, with your dating or marriage, and how you use your resources, people of faith who are adding, who are growing in their faith, are people who go about their lives with great energy to produce the most excellent character in everything that they do, with their money, with their family, with their time, with their morals. Everything they're doing is meant to be excellent for God. They want to display God's character in the world through the way that they live. I'm thinking, especially in the Old Testament, of Ruth and Boaz, the Old Testament book of Ruth. Fantastic, beautiful story. It's only four chapters. I encourage you, go read it. Go study it. It's incredibly helpful. But in that book, both Ruth and Boaz, Boaz is called a worthy or excellent man, uh, which really means a man of noble character in the Old Testament. And Ruth is called a worthy or excellent woman, a woman of noble character. That's what it means. So they're both these two people that are, uh, they end up getting married in the story. Well, what's amazing is they're from different ethnic, different religious, different country backgrounds as well. They're from very different backgrounds, but they both come to faith in Christ, come to faith in God. And as they are living out their faith, you can see that everything they do is of noble character. That's why they're described that way in the book, by the people around them. They are admired, they're respected, because even in some of the challenging situations that they faced, they trusted God, and out of that trust, out of that belief that God is really for them, God is working, God is providing, God loves them, God saved them, they are saying, every aspect of my life is His. I'm not going to go about it in such a way that looks like me saving myself, me trying to make myself look good, me trying to get what I want for myself. Instead, they said, how do I live in such a way that in any and every circumstance, God is displayed in my life? So they sought to bring the finest character to the way that they approached their questions, their challenges, and their struggles. See, Ruth had an opportunity, potentially, to uh, maybe seduce Boaz so that she could get security from him and have a life instead of being a refugee she or someone who had very little and was basically in poverty and trying to support her mother-in-law. She could have seduced him, but she refused to do that. And instead, she submitted her life to him and, and, and invited him to care for her. But he'd already been caring for her and protecting her. He could have taken advantage of her. There were some clear opportunities, or he could have let some other men take advantage of her. But it says in Ruth that Boaz intentionally protected her from harm so that other people couldn't take advantage of her when she didn't have anything or didn't have any way to protect herself. These two people coming at it where they both uh, might want something, but instead of just taking what they want, they submitted themselves to God and to one another. And everyone around them saw their noble character. They carried themselves with nobility, with honor, with dignity that they extended towards one another. Uh, as Again, as Conrad Mbiwe, pastor from Zambia, Africa, said, people can't really see your faith. That's an internal thing. But what they can see is your virtue. They can see your excellent moral character. They can see your life. And so the question that we have to ask, he says, is do people see excellence in your life? Moral excellence, not just great skill at something, but moral excellence, the display of the character of God in your life. We also, he also says, do you see moral transformation? Have you moved more towards what is right rather than staying stuck in what is wrong? In fact, 2 Peter is all about this. Peter says that if you aren't growing, it's because you've forgotten what you are. We'll get to that in a little bit. You've forgotten that you've been transformed. So the question is, do you see moral transformation in your life? Do you see moral distinction in your life? Are you actually distinct from the culture around you because you're a Christian? Does your life exhibit moral excellence? Since you've come to faith in Christ, do those who live with you, who work with you, who go to school with you, who play sports with you, do they see an increased desire and effort on your part to take responsibility for yourself, to discern right from wrong, and then to live it? What do people see when they look at your life? Do you appear the same as you always have? 
Or do people around you say, I can see your progress in the faith? Paul says that to Timothy, in fact. He says, let everyone see your progress in the faith. And that wasn't so that Timothy could be proud, but rather what he meant was let people see that your character is actually growing, that you actually look more like God each year, that you actually love God more each year, that you love your neighbor a little more each year. Are you growing in moral excellence, in moral distinction, in virtue or goodness? Living in the world, but not living exactly the same as the world around you. Brothers and sisters, I want to propose to you that right now, look at our world. People are longing for people of moral, excellent character. As we listen to our black and brown brothers and sisters, hear the pain and fear and exhaustion that they've been experiencing for far too long. As we look at changing broken systems in our country, as we correct what has been harmful and seek to enhance what is helpful in the judicial system, in our legislative system, and in our police departments, as we consider what sort of people ought we to be, what sort of society ought we to be creating? Do you see that one thing we most certainly need, even if we don't always agree politically or which policy to vote for or to bring into play, what we most certainly need is men and women of faith who are actually adding to their faith, at least in the Christian community, but certainly everywhere. We need men and women who are adding to their faith moral excellence and distinction. We can no longer tolerate this. We can no longer have a casual faith that says, well, I go to church. I, I believe. I, I think the Bible is true, and I pray. Fantastic. But that's only your foundation. Your foundation leads you somewhere. You have to furnish it. You have to furnish the foundation. For far too long, we've been too comfortable. That's some of what's being called out right now in a helpful way. That for those, especially those of us who maybe haven't experienced lifelong fear of injustice or indignity around every corner we turn, we have to confess not only our faith in church, but we have to confess our sin that we maybe have been far too casual, far too casual about living with moral excellence in our communities. Because look at our communities. They are not excellent for everyone. They're not excellent for everyone. They are not safe for everyone. They are not good for everyone. They're good for some. They're safe for some, but they're not safe for all. They're not good for all, which means that brothers and sisters, at least in our part, as believers, as people in a local church, in local communities, we, we must together, this isn't just individuals, this is together as a body, display and exhibit moral excellence because that would mean we are making a more excellent community, a place that is actually rooted in our faith, grounded in truth, so that those around us actually see our progress in growth, our growth in repentance, our growth in treating others truly well, our growth in listening and understanding, our growth in seeking to set things right whenever we can. How do we know if we as a church are growing in moral excellence, in moral distinction? How do you know if even as an individual Christian, you're growing in excellence, growing in moral distinction? I think we could ask ourselves some questions. If our church up and left this community tomorrow, would anyone else know the difference? Would anyone notice if we disappeared overnight, would people lament? Because even if they didn't agree with our beliefs or weren't Christians themselves, our faithful Christian presence in the community would actually, if it was gone, people would lament. Because they've seen, they've seen on display a certain character that they hope more, will, more of will exist in our communities. If you dropped a class, if you moved out of your apartment or your family's house, if you transferred to a different job, would there be grief? like a funeral? Or would there be joy like at a party? Would people be grieving because they'd say, where else are we ever going to find such a great employee, such an incredible person who lived so well for others, who, who did the right thing as every possible chance they had? Where are we going to find someone else like that? Or are they celebrating? Are they celebrating because they couldn't wait for us to leave? This isn't about uh, whether whether everyone agrees with us on our beliefs or not in our communities, but people around us in our Christian communities and 
in our broader communities, we as Christians, brothers and sisters, are to be displaying the character of Christ. As Paul tells Timothy, set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. And Paul tells Titus, Titus, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. Is that true about Do you think of yourself as saying, as a Christian, I'm meant to be an example in my community? Not just a, a good leader in my community. I'm meant to be an example, an example of the character of God in speech, in love, in purity, in faith, in how I conduct myself, in I'm supposed to be, as he said to Titus, a model of good works, showing integrity and dignity in how I interact, and speaking soundly with words that cannot be condemned. Wouldn't that be amazing? All, almost all words are condemned in our call-out culture right now, and some of them need to be. But at the same time, what if we were a people of sound, healthy speech is what that means, where out of our mouth came words where people could find nothing to condemn in them because they were rooted in dignity and integrity towards all. It may be hard to believe, but I want to say, as I think Peter's saying in this passage, you can do this. You can do this. This isn't just like try harder and do it, but in another sense, yes, try harder and do it. Make every effort. Peter says, make every effort. But final question, how? How do we do it? If that's what virtue is and what it looks like, how do we do it? How do we get it? Um, we have to go back and see that verses 3 and 4 in chapter 1 tell us how we get it, how we're able to do it. Two things, God's divine power and God's divine nature. Verse 3, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these things he has given us, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through these promises you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. How do we do it? God's divine power has given you everything you need for a godly life, he says. And secondly, through him, through God, through your faith in Christ, you have been made able to participate in the divine nature. There's divine power at work in your life if you're a believer. And that divine power is leading you internally to have the divine nature. Not to be God, but to have the character like God. God is doing that work so you can work with him. Does that make sense? What Peter points out is that God has changed everything about us by his own power, by his own nature. He has given us what we need to live a godly life, but we are participants. We are partakers, it says. You may participate in the divine nature. You are a participant now in God's character. How so? Because God has orchestrated his power so that you and I are gifted a godly life. And so now we can participate in it. If we fast forward a couple verses, uh, we see in verse 8 and 9, it says, For if you possess these qualities, these, these eight things that we saw in verses 5 to 7, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, again, growth, in increasing measure, they will keep you, these qualities, faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, love, etc., they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you confess faith, if you have faith, the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've come to know him, you relate to him, did you realize that you could still be ineffective or unfruitful? That faith is supposed to go somewhere. It's supposed to grow. It's a foundation that's meant to be furnished. And if you do not, if you do not possess the qualities, if you're not adding them to your faith, you're not seeking to grow with what God has already given you, you become, he says, ineffective and unproductive. And, and so no one will see the character of God in the world because we are displaying it. We're not effective and not productive. We're not fruitful. It's not showing up in the world. And so the world is missing out on what it most needs, the character of God himself, to which, by God's good grace, you and I get to be a part of, participants in God's character. 
It's amazing. He's such a loving, sharing God that he actually shares his character so that it will flow through us and reshape the world around us. So friends, you have a calling. You have a vocation, and it's not your job first. Your first uh, calling is to no longer be ineffective at goodness, at virtue, at moral excellence, but rather because God has transformed you by faith in Christ, you have a new employment in your job. You're not unemployed, you're employed. And you get to grow up into Christ-likeness, grow up into his character. He has given you everything you need. There's nothing more for you to do in terms of getting right with God, getting what God has, making God like you. No, all of that's done. He's accomplished it by his divine power and he's gifted you his divine nature. So this is what we need every day. How do we get virtue in a way? Peter says in verse 9, Whoever does not have these things, these qualities, is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they've been cleansed from their past sins. What do you and I need? Every day, we have to get up and remind ourselves, God has already given me what I need. Otherwise, I'll forget, Peter says. Forget, and it's like I'm, near, I'm so nearsighted that I'm blind. Uh, I am nearsighted, so I can only see things pretty close. And he's like, if you don't remember what you are in Jesus, that you have already received divine power, you have already received the divine nature and character, that by God's own glory and goodness, he has given you his glory and goodness to live and display in your life. If you forget all of that, you won't become effective. You won't be an effective Christian. We're no longer to be casual people who just say, yes, I believe in God. We are to be people who exert every energy, every effort of our lives towards growth, towards, uh, towards displaying God's character in the world. We must heed the command. It is a command. Grow. You must grow, friends. And if you're afraid that I'm reducing the Christian life right now to doing hard tasks, or this sounds like striving. Wait, I have to make every effort? I have to work really hard at this? Yes. But if that sounds like reducing uh, Christianity, because you say, well, aren't we saved by grace? Aren't we saved by faith? It's not my own works that save me, but God's works that save me. Yes, absolutely, that is true. But you don't, become, you don't become a Christian by working your way into God's good graces. Rather, it's Jesus' finished work on the cross and in his resurrection that brings you into God's good graces. You didn't do that. He did that. But as Welsh preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones so helpfully put it, the error of justification by works, of thinking that you have to earn your way to God, is entrusting to the discipline of your own soul to save your soul. But the opposite to trusting your own works is not to do nothing. It is to do everything, but not to put your trust in any of it. It is not the works that are wrong. It is the faith in your works, trusting your works, that is wrong. Do you see? Good works are never wrong. We don't stop doing them because we're Christians. In fact, we should be called all the more to exert every effort into doing them. But it's not because now we're strivers, per se, in trying to get our way back to God. The works themselves aren't wrong. What's wrong is when you trust them to make God like you. They don't. God doesn't like you for what you've done. In sin, we have fallen and we're corrupted, but God saved us and made us what we are. When we forget that, we miss everything that we need to grow every day, to say, actually, I have a purpose today. I have, I have love to give. I have more moral excellence to display. I should be going about my family, work, money, resources, all of it used for the glory of God to display his character so that in these relationships, in these efforts that I'm putting in all around me, the character of God is being displayed. Friends, let me close by just reminding you of Ruth and Boaz and saying that God's divine power and divine nature were already at work in them. That was what made them able to participate in their community in such a way that the people around them said, wow, what, what noble character. So let me ask, do you realize, do you really realize every day you are a Christian? You have been gifted everything you need, verse 3 says, for life and godliness. You already have it. Do you realize that you are a partaker of the divine nature? You're a participant in God's holy character? Do you realize that the Son of God came from heaven to earth 
and went even to a cross to save you, to deliver you from all of your lusts, from all of the struggles of the world, in order to give you a new character that is no longer corrupted by those things. Are you going to, you don't want to remain in that condition if you've been given a new one. The call for us is to live out that new condition. Let me say a final warning that if you don't want this, if you're not interested in growing in Christ-likeness, it might be that you aren't actually a Christian. But you're religious. You, you have a, a form of faith or you have a way of showing up to church and saying, I care about church. I care about the Bible a little bit, but I'm not really that interested in putting effort into growing into the character of God. But that's what it means to be a Christian, is to long for every day to grow in the character of Christ. This energizes us. This is what we want to be about. We want God's virtue to be displayed in the world. We want him to be on display through us, his people. So if you're longing for a world that would look different than the one that we live in now, what you're longing for is moral excellence. And you and I don't have it on our own. But when we're in Christ, we have it and can grow into it. You can make a difference in, the broken, in this broken world um, by depending on God and being one who grows in true virtue. Not virtue signaling, not just looking good, but doing good because we've been made good by the goodness of God himself. If you truly want to be free from the harmful systems of this world, then we have to and get, get working on reframing, reforming those harmful systems. You must be reformed yourself. And so friends, let me, for you who are Christians, let this be a reminder of who we are. And if you're not a Christian, consider praying this prayer. Savior, cry, we cry out to you. You are a real Savior. I need real salvation. Jesus, save me. Save me from rebellion and sin. Save me from my casual morality that makes little difference for my neighbors. Save me in such a way that there would be a real desire and a real hunger for godliness in me, for growth in my life. Save me in such a way that your goodness, your moral excellence shines out from my life into your world. Give me a moral excellence and godliness so distinct from this exhausting, hurtful world that other people might notice that you have saved me that I am joyfully content to be your child, and that I am growing up in your family ways, growing up to be like my father, who only does good.